This is the moment of a life. Peace and blessings, everyone. I am Michael B. Beckwith, the founder of Agape International Spiritual Center. And you know what? This is our moment of choice. This book is hot. I want you to know that. This, we, we are pleased to be launching the Source of Synergies Foundation's new book, Our Moment of Choice, Evolutionary Visions and Hope for the Future, featuring, featuring 43 members of the Evolutionary Leader Circle. And I am pleased and honored to be one of them. Our, this launch from Agape today is the second stop on the caravan of unity that began at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco and will continue across America and Europe, carrying a torch of hope and healing for this time of historic challenges. This is a moment of choice. Listen, for those of you who've heard me for a while, you know that we're living in fluxed up times which means that things are moving at a very rapid pace. We're in a planetary shift, and we're in a shift of priorities that are breaking up the old paradigm right here and right now throughout the country and throughout the world. And whenever there's a flux going on like this, if we expand our awareness, we move into choiceability, and we move away from reactionary actions. This is a moment of choice. So much is going on, and the fabric of normality no longer exists, which means we can step in and we can ask ourselves, in substance, how can you tell the future? By making the future. And our future will be made by the choices we make right here and right now. So this moment of choice is a moment of expanded awareness and we get, in which we get to participate and choose the future we're going to live in. By not only by the thoughts that we think, the visions that we carry, the conversations that we have, all of that moves us into action that's in harmony with the evolutionary impulse that governs all creation. So this particular moment in which we are launching the moment of choice by these brilliant 43 authors is a moment of torch carrying of possibility. In other words, we're standing in an awareness that nothing is impossible. That if we carry the frequency and the vibration of a vision of a world that works for the highest and best within us all, we match that frequency with our action and with a coherence of a community that's growing and glowing for the presence and the power and, and the love of cosmic intelligence, oh, the world will be changed forever. The world is a collection of beliefs and opinions and positionalities. We will be changing the world. And this particular book, this moment of choice, is going to assist that. I want you to feel into that with me right now. Because we have the privilege here at Agape to be the second point of launching this magnificent movement. In other words, this is not merely a book. It's not merely a moment. It's a movement. And we want you to be a part of this movement of conscious evolution into the next stage of our species by participating more than you've ever participated before. This, this is our moment of choice. Choice. Choice, 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 choice. Jacqueline, come forward. So on this caravan of unity that we're taking, join us in this caravan of love. It's time to stand up and fight. It's all right. Hand in hand, we'll take a caravan all across this land. Mm -hmm. One by one, we're gonna stand with the pride. One that can't be denied. And valley low 
bring the young and the old. Won't you let your love flow from your heart? Everyone, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Everybody, take a stand. Join our caravan of love. Stand up. Jacqueline Brown Benefield exhorting us to a moment of choice. We're living in unprecedented times and we must be unprecedented people. That is, we must break out of our previous paradigm to invite the next stage of our own unfolding. This is our moment of choice. As I'm speaking to you right now, feel into this affirmation. My moment of choice begins with my expanded awareness. My expanded awareness continues as I dive deep into my own soul. Feel into that right now. And affirm with me in this moment that we will not waste this moment of choice. We will not waste this moment in which the normal is now dissolved into a totally flexible, pliable moment. We're not going to waste this time because we don't want anything to go back to normal. We want to go to the next stage of our unfolding by perfectly practicing vision, high conversation, affirmative prayer, life envisioning, study. And there is so much in this book that will carry you that you will then carry the vision. And so we stand in this awareness as we stand on the precipice of the nowness of this moment, peering over into the promised land of our own being, we see clearly a great vision of possibility for humanity. We're pulled by this vision to such a degree that we're called to transform from a glory to an even greater glory. This second stop in this caravan of unity right here at Agape is another launching point for the great hope of humanity, which is being in integrity with the love ethic of our soul. We feel it in our bones and we give thanks for it and so much more. And so it is. Amen. Now let's continue to launch this moment of choice. It's up to us dynamic blessings to you. woo The one and only Reverend Michael Bernard Beckwith coming to us from Agape International Spiritual Center. Stop number two on the Caravan of Unity on this very special day when we launch our moment of choice. It's an event, it's a book, it's a movement, and everyone is welcome aboard. Everyone is part of this. I want to give a special, special thank you, first of all, to Jacqueline Brown Benefield for her fantastic rendition of Caravan of Love, Love and Unity is what it's all about, and the Agape house band and backup singers, how wonderful you are and how inspiring and uplifting and activating. Don't you feel activated? I know I, know I do. And I want to thank everyone who is with us in this Zoom room today. 
So we have more than 20 members of the Evolutionary Leaders Circle who have contributed to this book, Our Moment of Choice, uh, which was published by Beyond Words Atria Books, an imprint of Simon & Schuster, and this is our very first day. And this book comes to you from the Source of Synergy Foundation. So we have with us evolutionary leaders who are part of this circle that is a project of the Source of Synergy Foundation. And we have many evolutionary leaders with us who contributed to the book and others who are waiting for volume two, which we hope will come soon. And then we also have members of the board of directors of the Source of Synergy Foundation with us and also our advisory board. And all of you are live with us on Zoom as well as some amazing musicians that you will hear from later. And then we want to welcome everyone who's watching on Facebook Live and everyone who's part of the Caravan of Unity. So we are, as Reverend Michael said, we're stop number two, Los Angeles, after the first stop, which happened on August 28th in, at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, and we'll be continuing on across the United States. There's a parallel caravan in Europe that launched today, and this will be ongoing until we reach all the way to uh, Peace Weekend around the International Day of Peace, when the caravan will be in New York City and then on to Washington, D.C. for September 28th. We'll have the close on the Mall and with Unity of Washington, D.C. with our own Reverend Sylvia Sumter. So there's quite a road ahead. But today we're celebrating this very <laughs> unique book. And to introduce the book to you, I would like to present a visionary among visionaries, the founder of the Source of Synergy Foundation, and also a contributor, a beautiful chapter, exciting chapter to the book, Our Moment of Choice, Diane Marie Williams. Thank you, Deborah, uh, Reverend Michael Beckwith, Jacqueline, and Agape Ban. Wow, what a spectacular opening. Thank you so much. So on behalf of the Source of Synergy Foundation, I would like to welcome everyone to today's program. Thank you so much for being here today to celebrate the launch of our new book, our moment of choice, evolutionary visions, and hope for the future. That includes 43 amazing contributing authors from our evolutionary leader circle. And as Deborah said, published by Beyond Words, Atria Books, an imprint of Simon & Schuster. And our deep gratitude goes out to everyone that has brought to life this book, today's program, and this movement, too numerous to name, but know that we honor and appreciate each and every one of you. And it's a, two, a true blessing to have the book's amazing editors, Bob Atkinson, Kurt Johnson, and Deborah Muldow, and more than half of the contributing authors with us today. Thank you so much for donating your inspiring chapters to support this movement and for infusing our moment of choice with your wisdom, light, and commitment to the greater good. We are deeply grateful. And we're also grateful to our amazing and awesome, awesome book advisor, the inspiration behind the title, our moment of choice, Greg Braden, who will be joining us soon. Also here to celebrate this launch are three phenomenal musicians, Kristen Hoffman, Pato Batan, and Antoinette Roosdaughter Hall. And to all of you tuning in, thank you for being part of a movement made up of millions of people around the globe that are seizing this moment of choice and becoming an unstoppable force field of love, light, healing, and hope for the future. And we're very excited that today's program, as Michael and Deborah said, is the second stop on the Caravan of Unity that is creating waves of hope, unity, and inspiration across the world. Uh, we dedicate this program and our wider effort, efforts to all those that are suffering in the world. Know that you have a community that cares, and we are linking with you through our hearts and prayers. So friends, we have arrived at our moment of choice. There has never been a more urgent moment for humanity to come together. We know that what we as humanity does at this moment in time will determine the destiny of not only our species, but countless others on planet Earth. So let's just take a moment to truly feel the responsibility of that. So in order to usher in the new, we need to have full and complete confidence in ourselves and others that we can do this because it's totally achievable. 
Research from Harvard University shows that every peaceful social movement from 1900 to 2006 that got active participation from at least 3.5% of the population succeeds within a year of reaching that threshold. So couple that with the Maharishi effect that shows when only the square root of 1% of the population comes together and achieves inner peace and coherence through the practice of meditation, that this coherent has a measurable influence on the quality of life of that population. So 3.5% of 7.8 billion people equals 273 million people. 1% of 7.8 billion people is 78 million people. So that's very good news for us because those who are responding to the powerful call of the time, including all of you and the millions of organizations and networks uniting in a shared sense of responsibility for the common good easily include more than 273 million people. So we got this. We're on that threshold of success. A new world is being born. So since time is of the essence right now, it's a global imperative that we accelerate this birth by choosing well during our moment of choice. Life is a series of choices from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed, we're making choices. We know when there's enough light power generated, the unconsciousness of the world begins to either dissolve or transmute to match the frequency of that light. And it's important to see each choice we make as an opportunity to further ignite this matrix of light. And sometimes we have to hit the pause button to ask ourselves, will this choice I'm about to make move us forward to that threshold of success or not? Is what I am thinking, doing, or about to say going to add to the light needed for us to succeed? Is it necessary? Will it contribute to the well being of myself, others, and our environment? or create division, doubt, or reaction that could have a negative ripple effect in the field. And since we're all connected by consciousness, all of our choices, even simple everyday choices, truly matter because they register in the quantum field and have an impact on what happens to the whole. And it's been truly heartwarming to see so many acts of kindness, especially during these challenging times, including people choosing to pay the rent of a stranger during the pandemic, healthcare professionals holding the hand of somebody that is dying of COVID when they take their last breath because their loved ones couldn't be with them, choices that display the true beauty of the human spirit. Acts of kindness allow each of us to be example setters and inspire others to make similar choices. Offering the best of who we are is our most important job right now. It's also inspiring to see so many people utilizing their innate capacities, their superpowers that we all have inside of us to lead us to new ways of living. Just a quick example is Lynn McTaggart's intention experiments and power of eight groups that are showing us what the power of oneness can do when a small group of people come together with intention. People are healing each other with these intentions and also the environment in as little as 10 minutes leaving scientists and the medical establishment astonished. So don't let anyone try to tell you that we can't manifest into being the new world. We can, and we are doing just that together through our light-filled choices and actions. We are showing up as an unstoppable force for transformation and offering true hope for the future. So let's be the generation that will be able to say that we were close to extinction, but we came together at this moment of choice, stepped fully into our power, made bold choices and succeeded. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diane Marie Williams, our founder. None of this would have happened without you. So we, we cherish you. you. Now, as, uh, as you can see, there are many, many evolutionary leaders on this call. I know you're going to want to hear from everyone who contributed to the book. So we've asked all of our fantastic writers to be very brief in their responses. And um, we're going to start, before we get deep into the book, we're going to start with a few words from the other side of the world, from down under in Australia, where we have Ben Bowler, he is one of our evolutionary leaders. He's the head of Unity Earth, 
which was the guiding light behind the caravan of unity. So we have asked Ben to get up in the middle of the night and say a few words about the caravan of unity, Ben Bowler. Thank you, Deborah, and uh, thank you, Diane. And it's wonderful to be here with you on this very, very special day. What a what an amazing opening from Reverend Michael Beckwith and uh, Jacqueline and the band to be here, first of September, twenty twenty, um, and to be here launching this extraordinary work, our moment of choice. Moments ago, in Europe, they had the opening ceremony for the Caravan of Unity across Europe. Um, several days ago, we launched uh, the Global Caravan of Unity at Grace Cathedral, and it's now here. This is the second stop as we get ready uh, for Pato Banton and Antoinette Root's daughter later today with a special feature presentation, and then on to Las Vegas and up to Colorado for Labor Day weekend events. And this is all part of this great coming together and this great rising as we build up to Peace Weekend and, and showing up on the world stage for our movement of unity and peace and compassion and justice and social um, awareness and ecological uh, sustainability showing up on the world stage with a historic force. And this work with these brilliant evolutionary leaders that have contributed the 43 contributions to this extraordinary book. What a great honor it is uh, for the Caravan of Unity to be with you here today uh, and for thank, thank you so much for all the work that you've, you've done to make this happen. And may it be blessed and may it have the impact beyond our reckoning in the world that so badly needs the wisdom and the light that you have brought together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ben Bowler. Now, there are a few of our contributors who couldn't be with us today, but they wanted to be here, so they sent videos. So we're going to hear next from two of your favorite authors, Dr. Bruce Lipton and Lynn McTaggart. Hi, dear friends, cultural creatives and seekers everywhere. Bruce Lipton here, cell biologist and author of the best-selling books, The Biology of Belief, Spontaneous Evolution, and The Honeymoon Effect. Well, I'm here because there's an urgent matter that really is our moment of choice now, a moment of choice where we can change the future. Why is this so important at this moment? And the answer is profoundly simple. That science has recognized for the last 15 years that human civilization is precipitating the sixth mass extinction of life on this planet. Five times in the history of this planet, life was thriving and some cataclysmic event wiped out life, up to 90% of it. The last mass extinction, 66 million years ago, was when a comet hit the Yucatan Peninsula. And this is the comet that upended the environment and wiped out the dinosaurs and up to 90% of life on this planet. Well, for the last 15 years, science has been telling us that human behavior has precipitated the sixth mass extinction. And that if we don't change our behavior in a way to serve ourselves and our planet, then we are all facing extinction. So this is a very serious, turbulent time. But what's really interesting about this time is that we are all participants in an evolutionary process. Crisis precipitates evolution and the global crises that we're experiencing right now are informing us of the need for an evolutionary upheaval. So this is a time for new knowledge to come into the world and help us move from where we are to a, a sustainable, thrivable situation. The most important understanding is knowledge because knowledge is power. And if you have an understanding of knowledge of what's going on in the world, why is it going on, where is it going on, how is it going on, we'll be equipped to handle the situation and safely move into the future. So in order to thrive through these very chaotic times, it's necessary to have knowledge because we're quite aware of the fact that knowledge is power. And the knowledge that I think will help us thrive into the future is going to be found in this wonderful book, Our Moment of Choice. This is a compendium of many different philosophers, research scientists, economists, religious leaders, all giving us information about what's going on in the world, why we're experiencing this chaos, and how we can safely and effectively move into the future. In order to do this, all of us are participants in this process. So I really highly suggest to be very effective to save your family and your community is to look into this book, Our Moment of Choice and read why and what and where our evolution is happening right now. This is a ticket to our future. Please invest in this very important book with knowledge 
that will help us not just survive, but thrive into the future. The information about this book is available below. Thank you for listening to this message. Hi, my name is Lynn McTaggart. This is our moment of choice. And the reason is that we're facing an unprecedented crisis in every aspect of our lives. We're facing the ending of the story of who we are and how we're supposed to live. We're coming to an end of days in our current way of life. This book, Our Moment of Choice, is important because it's assembled a group of new thought leaders who have a very different story to tell, who have a new path through to a better future, who are uncovering all of the latent powers we have to live in a more holistic way. In my own case, I talk about the new science showing that we have healing hidden powers within us to heal ourselves, our lives, the world, by assembling in small groups. But we can't do this alone. This has to be a movement. So what do you choose to do in the weeks and months ahead? Thank you for listening. And if you'd like to find out more about our moment of choice, please go to our moment of choice dot com. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce Lipton and Lynn McTaggart. You heard from these scientists how urgent the situation is right now. And this is why the book has such extraordinary timing. We almost feel like it has a destiny of its own. But it wouldn't have happened without my co-editor, Bob Atkinson. So I'd like us to hear a little bit from Bob about the origins of this project and perhaps a bit also about what he wrote in his wonderful chapter in the book, Bob Atkinson. Thank you so much, Deborah and Bruce and Lynn and special thanks to uh, Reverend Michael and Jacqueline. What a rousing way to bring us into this special moment. <laughs> This book is uh, really a testament to how rewarding teamwork can be. It was synergy and action that brought this book into being. After having an idea for a book like this with many of the same contributors in 2012, it wasn't until I became a member of the Evolutionary Leaders Circle in 2018 that I proposed the idea to Diane and Deborah. That's when I found out that the Evolutionary Leaders had a similar book project about 10 years ago but wasn't completed. With the decision to, go, to move ahead, Deborah and Kurt agreed to be co-editors with me. A proposal with some guiding questions was sent out to all the evolutionary leaders and many quick responses came back from those who wanted to contribute a chapter. We were serendipitously led to Beyond Words, an imprint of Simon and & Schuster, and that was another wonderful team to work with. And the book came together quite smoothly in about a year. The book is organized into seven thematic circles to illustrate that from the decay of an old worn out system of hierarchy and separation, there is a new story emerging, one of wholeness, equity, and unity. All the chapters in the book are threads of one tapestry, all key elements of this new story. My chapter, a holistic vision of evolution and consciousness offers a big picture perspective of what ties all things together in this vast creation. If we have a holistic view of reality, as the Buddha did when he said that all things originate from one essence and are destined to one aim, we would see evolution in all realms as purposeful, directional, and leading to a desired outcome. And this has played out over many spiritual epics that have each brought about a leap in consciousness. That means that the nature of consciousness is to evolve toward a desired outcome as well, toward the innate potentiality of wholeness and unity. 
And this is what we see unfolding all around us right now in the streets and everywhere. So our moment of choice is more than a book, as many have said already, it is a movement. This moment in time is what every single member of the human family is here for now. We each have a role to play in this critical moment. This is our moment to unite in purpose, to ensure our collective well being. Humanity is coming of age. In fact, the very nature of the evolution of consciousness gives us an abiding hope for the future. Thank you so much, Bob Atkinson. We're so grateful to you. Truly could not have happened without you. Thank you. So now it's time for us to dig into the book. And as Bob mentioned, the book is divided into seven circles that are thematic areas. And uh, circle seven, which is about the big picture, is one of the final circles in the book. But we're going to start with it today because we want to give you the big picture. And we have uh, three of the writers from that circle with us. Two of them are longtime distinguished pioneers in the movement of conscious evolution, Dr. Jean Houston and Professor Irvin Laszlo. And they are the co-recipients of the 2020 Source of Synergy, Synergy Superstar Awards. So we're very excited to have them with us, along with Justin Fairman, who is one of our younger rising stars in conscious evolution. So I'd like to start with Professor Laszlo, whose chapter is Reasoning and Experiencing Our Way to Oneness. So Irvin Laszlo, could you tell us a bit about how we can reason our way to oneness? It's very much a question of credibility. What do we believe? What is authority in, in the world today? Authority is science, and it's an unprecedented fact that modern science has influenced the way we act in the world. Unfortunately, modern science did not reflect the way that it is being presented to the world, the way it has affected the world, it does not present the best of science. It presents a particular view, a superficial view. Modern science is influenced more than anything else by the Newtonian, Darwinian, and to some extent also the Freudian view. And these views lead to a kind of a world where competition is primer, where the world itself is immaterial, is, is in un, undirected, indifferent, I want to say. It's just a passive field of particles moving about in space and time without any purpose and deeper meaning for that. All of this random interaction somehow gives rise to the world. This was mainstream science is main, main program and belief system. And this justified, this justified acting as though the world around us doesn't have consciousness, as though we are not owing to recognize it as being part of us is just a passive background to us. We can do with it what we want. It has justified our competing because in this world, according to the Darwinian interpretation, only the fittest survives. And all of this is finally motivated by a self-centered drive, which in the Freudian sense is a libido and all, all what we do are like basically a strong system oriented by these inner drives that we cannot master. Our world became a power hungry world of creating ever more competition for power, for money, for the greater power and, and influence over each other and over nature. And this world is created an inequitable, dangerously undisbalanced situation on this planet. This book tries, and I think that's so successfully, bring in evidence that this interpretation of science, this credibility on which the Western world has been basing its actions, 
is not the true one. It's not the right. It's not, it's not with the world as it is. There we now have system sciences. We have the quantum sciences. We have quantum biology, quantum consciousness research. We have all of the new evidence coming forth that we are an interconnected, highly directed whole, not a passive one, not a mechanistic one. So the time has come to shift over. Let me just end by this, noting this. Some of us have been talking about this for 20 years. And what I hear today, for example, is very much repeating, reinforcing what I've been saying all this time. And it's a joyful moment for me and for my colleagues who have been trying to pioneer this new paradigm. Even the very notion of a paradigm before it was just applied to physics, uh, to a paradigm shift from Newtonian to, to Einsteinian physics. Now it turns out that all of paradigm is applying to everything. They are all based on paradigmatic thinking and acting. And that paradigm that we are basing our confidence on, our credibility, is obsolete. It's a false paradigm. So the time has come to recognize there is a better science, a more credible truth about what the world is like. And most of all, that one, that truth is in us. We can discover it. Rationality through science is one way. Experiencing the world. That's through us. That's even more convincing, more cogent way. Because when we go back into ourselves, even if for a few moments a day, we recognize that we are people, we are beings who are part of a larger whole. Being part of a larger whole is part of the religious experience, typical of the religious experience. William James said that. And, but this experience now is coming through everywhere because this pandemic, this crisis, this global shift is forcing us to go into ourselves, to search for what we are, to search for our roots, for our source. This reconnection to the source that I've been expounding recently, I think has become an imperial necessity, an absolute necessity in the world. We can experience the oneness. It's in us. It's in every cell of our body. It's on every community of life on Earth. It's on every galaxy. We can experience it. And this book, I think, is a way, is a way show, showing the way, as a sign to show we can, how we can experience our oneness. The expression, expression of that is the term love unconditional love. That's the experience that explicates, explains the oneness, the love that we feel. The love is in us, the love is in the world. This world could not exist without the attraction of the, posit of the positron, of the, of the neutron and the, and, and, and the electron, forming atoms, forming molecules, forming cells, forming life, webs of life, forming entire galactic systems. This is a directed world. That's the true science, the new science, and the very old science at the same time. It's an age-old insight. We have disregarded it because the followers of Newton, the followers of Darwin, the followers of Freud have exaggerated and misrepresented what these great scientists actually truly meant. They were all deeply spiritual people. They would not have believed the doctrines that are propagated by the followers. It's time to recognize this. Then there's a new science coming forth. Bruce Lipton was just talking about it. This is a new science of wholeness, of oneness. It's the way forward and it's in us. Let's discover it. This book helps us to do so. Thank you so much, Irvin Laszlo. It's so beautiful to see your life work coming into fruition. And Jean Houston is someone who meets this experience of life with more joy and zest than anybody that we know. So Jean Houston, can you tell us a little bit about the way of the social artist? Jean, you're on mute. 
We need to hear you. I think it has been expressed so beautifully by Irvin and everything that has happened that I'd like to put it in a poem and then very briefly in an experience. The poem is by Christopher Fry and it goes, the human heart can go to the lengths of God. Dark and cold we may be, but this is no winter now. The frozen misery of centuries, cracks, breaks, begins to move. The thunder is the thunder of the flood, the flow, the upstart spring. Thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to meet us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul folk ever took. Affairs are now soul-sized. The enterprise is exploration into God. What are we waiting for? What are we making for? It takes so many thousand years to wake. But shall we wake for pity's sake? And with those lines, I was thinking of what can I offer that is an algorithm of this love that is bringing the world, the soul, back together again? And here's a little brief exercise. If you put your hand over your heart, the, the human heart can go to the lengths of God. Let's travel those lengths. And close your eyes, and I'd like you to think of two people anywhere in the world, they might be here, with whom you can share this lovingness, this connection. Feel the great interconnectivity between you and these two people. And the algorithm of love says that this love then it generates even more love so that these two people are thinking of two more people and they have two more people and they have two more and two more until everyone in this world is interconnected with this algorithm of love. But it's not just people, it's, it's creatures, it's beings. Think of two creatures, two beings, two animals. I think of two beloved dogs of mine and connect with those. And they in some way are connecting with two more animals and they with two more and two more and two more until all the animals and creatures of the earth are interconnected. And then think of two living greening plants, things who being this from nature and send your lovingness to them and let them send the lovingness to two more creatures, two more plants, vegetations, living greenness, and they do two more, two more, two more. And now all living beings are interconnected. And now send all of this beingness to the planet herself. And she connects with two more planets and two more and two more and two more. And they do two suns and two suns and two more. And now all beingness in this universe is connected and all connected to the mind and soul and heart of God, or whatever you choose to call to being itself, to the life force that moves the sun and all the spheres, and from the mind and heart of God, through all this interconnection that you have established and into your own heart, and from your heart through all living beings, and the mind of heart and God back to you, and you to the lengths of God, and the lengths of God through everything, everything, all things, all beingness to you. For you have lived out that great knowing, the human heart can go to the lengths of God. Thank you. Thank you, Jean Houston, for that powerful experience of cosmic love. Thank you. Justin Fairman, these are big footsteps that you follow in, but you are amazing in your own right. And your chapter is about evolving our culture from breakdown to breakthrough. And I'm sure everybody wants to know how we're going to do that. Justin Fairman. Yeah, thanks, Deborah. It's an honor to stand on the shoulder of giants. And, um, and so we, we live at a really interesting and, and unique time in human history where we're faced with an extraordinary amount of hyper complexity. And this is being exacerbated by you know, the rise of technology and, and globalization 
And it's created a situation where it's very hard, almost impossible for any one person to understand the depth and nuance of all the interconnected systems on the planet and in human culture and human society. And obviously our, our culture and society of many have pointed out today is in some ways very broken and is having a lot of negative effects on the environment. And so something needs to change. And the way that we've been going about living and operating as a culture obviously is, is not working. And so we have to upshift into a new way of behaving, of interacting, of, of thinking and operating in order to save ourselves from ourselves. And so in the chapter that I wrote, I outlined what I believe to be are the three most important keys to doing that. And these are what I call meta strategies or, or, or first principle based um, uh, princi uh, operating principles that we can collectively embrace and start to uh, live by that will actually have the effect of shifting us out of the current situation that we're in and into what I call an enlightened future. And so you know, in order to, to come up with these strategies, we have to really look at the, the one and only system that works on the scale of a planet or even a universe that can produce symbiosis and flow and prosperity and abundance and all the things that we're trying to create here on the planet. And, and that's nature itself. So by trying to understand and, and mimic the first principles of nature, we're able to have the same outcomes that it produces, which is what I just spoke about. And so, you know, after deep thought and study for many years, um, I believe that those three core principles are one, sorting for deep symbiosis and self-healing. So if we look at nature, nature is always looking to create symbiosis. It's creating interconnected systems where everything thrives and that everything has the resources that it needs. And it also has the ability to, you know, self-heal itself if things are not working properly. And so by using that as a design constraint for our laws, for our businesses, for our communities, for anything that we're creating, if we can, if we can look to create symbiosis and self-healing through that system or through whatever it is that, that we're focusing on, we'll be in alignment with one of these first principles of nature that's been able to produce um, you know, thriving at a, at a universal scale for, for billions of years. The second key thing, I believe, is intuition. And intuition is really the, the universal language. You know, without humans, everything runs on intuition. You know, humans have a, a strong uh, bias towards logic and reason for a lot, for a lot of different uh, reasons itself. But nevertheless, when you, when you take humans out of the picture, nature runs on intuition. This is the operating system. This is the language of nature itself, of the universe. And this is a big part of how this grand symbiosis is created. And when we, begin, when we begin to operate from that same frame, from intuition itself, the same kind of effects begin to happen naturally in a highly leveraged way across all of the different aspects of humanity. And then finally, um, the last thing is in embodying purpose. And everything in nature, everything in reality has a purpose, but humans oftentimes forget what their purpose is or you know, haven't put the time in to discover what it is. But purpose is a key aspect of birthing genius. And as we know from observing nature, each piece plays an integral part in the whole. And each piece has a, a unique purpose that serves everything else and serves the stability of the whole system. And so when we figure out what our individual purposes are and begin to embody those consistently, we begin to, to fill that unique piece that only we can fill in human culture that again creates this larger symbiosis and a holistic abundance and thriving that we're looking for. So these three things, when, you, when applied at scale, uh, have the power to transform our society and do it in a way where we don't need to focus on all of the little details, but we can rest in the fact knowing that what we're doing in every moment is being an integral piece of the change that we wanna see. So that's what my chapter is about, and there's more details in how we can go about doing that successfully in it. And uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to share with everyone. Thank you, Justin Fairman. I'm sure everybody's going to want to learn more about this from you. And um, I love the way you talk about purpose bringing forth people's genius. Our next guest is also one of our younger evolutionary leaders, Shilpa Jane, and she has been empowering youth all over the world through her organization, YES. And um, 
she's also written a chapter in the book about her technology of jamming, which uh, enables cultivating connection, community collaboration and co-liberation. I give you Shilpa Jane. Thank you so much, Deborah, and what a beautiful group of people to be a part of. I'm so honored. Um, yes, I'll talk a little bit about jamming and then actually invite all of you into a little bit of an experience of it. Um, jamming really comes from the spirit of a musician's jam, the idea that each and every one of us, just as these speakers have been sharing, has a genius, has a gift, and also has questions, has struggles and doubts. And yet when we bring those things together and begin to listen to each other and attune, attune our creation songs with one another, attune our beingness with one another, and really work through and be present to the kinds of conflicts that we're facing. And um, we're able to generate something that is that symbiotic whole, that is that reflection of interdependence and wholeness that we're seeking in the world. And I think the key here is how do we work with conflict? Because conflicts exist and conflicts are not bad. The fear of our conflict sometimes is what keeps us and keeps us apart and also keeps us from being able to build um, the connections that we seek. And so a question that's very alive for me and that I share also in the book is around how do we build bridges in each moment instead of walls? And every single moment is a moment of choice around that. Do you wanna build a bridge? Do you wanna build a wall? And what does it take inside of you and inside of me to actually seek out that bridge instead of the wall? How do I need to slow down? What is it that I can look at in my own reactions, my fears, my insecurities, my, my, my loneliness, my grief? What is it that I can bring forward in my vulnerability and my honesty? And what can you bring forward? And how do we meet each other? As Jean was saying, heart to heart, our hearts are interconnected. And so how do we meet each other in those conflicts, in those moments? And God knows that I see that on our streets right now, that we really do need to slow down and start to meet each other. Um, we need to see that in our <laughs> highest levels of government as far beyond and also in everyday life. There's infinite opportunities to meet each other and to jam, to listen, to co-create to co-liberate and collaborate through the differences that we have. And so I just wanna invite each of you to tap in for a moment and, and I'll just ask a couple questions. And for our Facebook Live audience, I invite you to share in the chat and all of our contributors here on the Zoom if you also wanna share. But I just wanna ask a few questions like, what are you breathing life into right now? And what is making you come alive? And if we can tap into that aliveness in ourselves and listen to that from each other, can we synergize there? Can we sync up? And is it also possible that each of us has a key piece of moving and evolving us towards the world we wanna to see, towards that more interconnected, more just, more loving, more regenerative world that's possible? And so what are you doing there? What do you see as a defining moment, a defining choice that we have in this moment and what choice are you making? Thank you so much. I invite you for your answers to those questions. And, and we'd love to hear from you because this is a collaborative effort. This book is there as an invitation, as an invitation to dialogue, as an invitation to action, and that we really invite you forward with us to continue to build these moments of choice together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shilpa Jane. And thank you everybody for thinking deeply into your answers to the questions that Shilpa's put forth. We're going to watch two more videos now. We were not expecting to have John Perkins with us. He is in fact with us today with his little kitten, his Jaguar kitten. <laughs> uh, but we're going to hear from, uh, from John via his video. Uh, you all know him as the author of Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And also we're going to hear from uh, our dear friend, Jude Curvin, Dr. Jude Curvin, cosmologist, author of The Cosmic Hologram and the co-founder of The Whole World View. So let's have those videos now. Hi, John Perkins here. This is indeed our moment of choice. The pandemic and all the issues around race have made it very clear that we must come together as a people. You know, our reality as humans is molded by our perceptions of reality. There are no countries, there are no races, there are no human institutions except as we perceive them. And when enough people accept a perception or codify it into law, it has a huge impact on reality. So we must 
change our perception of separateness and realize that we must come together to protect ourselves, each other, and our planet. This book feels so important to me because that's what it's all about. And so we must ask ourselves that now more than ever, our moment of choice has come. So what would you choose to do in the weeks ahead? Please go to the website, ourmomentofchoice.com and order the book. Thanks. Conflicts, injustices, inequalities and exploitation of people and our planetary home Gaia are all symptoms of a deeper dis-ease of our collective psyche, our fragmented perception of reality and its illusory appearance of separation. In 2016, humanity made a choice under the auspices of the United Nations to agree 17 sustainable development goals aimed at eliminating all such abuses. With little progress since, we're here not only at another moment of choice, but perhaps our final moment of choice. Yet more scientific evidence than ever is available to us that shows that the separate appearance of our universe is not its true nature. Instead, discoveries are converging with universal wisdom teachings to reveal the unified nature of reality. This is our moment of choice to remember that our power is unity, our strength is diversity, and our hope is love in action. This book feels important to me because it shares such power, strength, and hope in loving action. Our moment of choice invites us to link up and lift up together in co-creative cooperation and offers insights, guidance, and companionship for how we can experience and embody personal, community, and collective wholeness. It shows how we can begin to restory what it means to be human, to restore our relationship with Gaia and the whole cosmos, and to consciously evolve. Our choices matter now more than ever. What will you choose in the days and weeks ahead? Please go to ourmomentofchoice.com to buy the book. Thank you, thank you. John Perkins, are you still here? Would you like to say hello? Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, bye. Got I your jaguar to... there. <laughs> Jaguars. It, it, so it was, it was really interesting that when, when Jean Houston was taking us on that journey to relate to, to uh, other animals, she's teething. So that's why she's, yeah. But look at her. She, so I went to her and she immediately jumped up on my lap. So she <laughs> coming. And she loves to participate in these. And I do think that, you know, thank you for, for that. It was very serious in that. But this, these are serious times, but it's also a time to realize that we've all got to have fun moving into this new consciousness, new, moving into this incredible period, this moment of choice. We need to do what comes from our heart and what we feel most, uh, what, what gives us the greatest bliss. So I just, I really want people to remember that, that this is a moment of choice and it's also a moment to choose to enjoy being at this incredible time of this phenomenal change in consciousness that we've been hearing about all morning. Thank you all. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, John Perkins. All right, are we ready for a change of pace? We have a big treat coming up. We are going to hear from the divine songstress, Kristen Hoffman, with a song she has prepared specially for us for launch day today. Kristen Hoffman. What an honor to be here celebrating the launch of our moment of choice. This song is called All Together Now. And in the second verse, you will hear the lyric, know our choice is in each moment. Here we go. Let's sing it out all together now. Let's raise our voices high. Cause no other time is a better time than now. 
This is the moment of a life. So many times life feels so lonely. Like you're the only one who cries. And then the tears they try to come on in and paint you cloudy skies. So open up and let the sun shine. Oh, I know you're not alone. We've all felt the weight of a heavy mind, but it's time now to let go. Let's sing it out all together now. Let's raise our voices high. Cause no other time is a better time than now. This is the moment of our life. So the next time you start a doubting, oh, just remember this song. And know your choices in each moment. You can start to sing along. Sing it out. Let's sing it out all together now. Let's raise our voices high. Cause no other time is a better time than now. This is the moment of our life. of our life yes it is that let's sing it out all all together now let's raise our voices high sing it out all the time it's a better time now this is the moment of our life this is the moment of our life The glorious Kristen Hoffman. Thank you so much. And I want to share that I have a new choral arrangement of this song. So if there are any people listening who have a choir or a chorus, please just reach out. I would be happy to share the choral arrangement with you. And how can they find you, Kristen? KristenHoffman.com. It's K R I S T I N H O F F M A N N dot com. <laughs> I invite you to sing all together now in your family and in your chorus and in your choir. Thank you. Celebrating this amazing book release. Such a great day. Thank you, Kristen. Such a great contribution to our day and to our lunch. Now we're going to dive back into the book, into another circle, into circle four, which is about healing ourselves and the planet. Couldn't be more urgent. And we have three contributors, uh, fantastic people with fantastic work. We have Lori Layden, who is busy healing trauma all over the world and also following school shootings and the tragedies that most of us want to look away from. And we also have uh, Joan Borisenko, who is a well-known pioneer in integrative medicine and, and the mind-body connection, and her husband, the brilliant educator, Gordon DeVeren. 
So let's hear first from Lori Layden a little bit about how we heal ourselves, our children, and our world. Thank you, Deborah. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, as a humanitarian and a trauma healing expert, as Deborah mentioned, I work in Rwanda with orphan genocide survivors. I work in Australia with Aboriginal and refugee communities, as well as post-school shooting environments. And that's why I see that uh, healing unresolved traumas is perhaps one of the greatest challenges of our time, as well as one of the greatest opportunities. With 52% of the world's population under the age of 30, and how many of those living in traumatic circumstances of violence, poverty, social injustice, illness, and a host of other things, I believe our focus needs to be on nurturing our next generation of young people to heal, work, and lead us into a peaceful future. We were lucky to do this on a smaller scale in Rwanda with our program, Project Light. And from this work, I've been blessed to see the miracles that are possible from tragedy, when people can heal their traumas and open their hearts to peace in their hearts. Our work focuses on healing hearts into coherence. This is a state where our hearts, our brains, and our bodies come into alignment physiologically. So we have access to our highest peace building skills like forgiveness, inner wisdom, creative problem solving, and even spiritual connectedness and collaboration. And the truth is that we have the technologies and the innovative therapies like EFT tapping, the grace process, and Project Light to, become, to nurture heart-centered peace builders worldwide. My vision is to establish Project Light centers around the world where young people have the opportunity to heal their traumas, engage in economically sustainable work and lead us into a peaceful future as heart-centered leaders. It's really a movement where we can build an army of peace builders, including parents, educators, mental health uh, professionals, and all those supporting young people to dedicate themselves to becoming peace builders from the inside out. Now, can you imagine what's possible from this place Will you join us? Will you commit to becoming a peace builder from the inside out? The choice and the time is now. Thank you. Oh, beautiful, Lori, what an invitation. Let's be that army of peace builders. What could, what could make for a better world than that? And won't that be helpful in creating the noble future that Gordon Tavarin and Joan Borisenko talk about in their chapter about becoming fully human. Gordon and Joan, why don't you tell us a little bit about how we do that? You will need to unmute. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Yeah, so what, what an honor to be part of this great book and this great occasion. Um, and I so appreciate, Lori, what you said, you know, the shift from Galileo's sun-centered universe to a heart-centered universe is exactly, I think, where we need to go. Um, so um, I just have a few notes. Our, our moment of choice is based on the really liberating premise that the future is not what happens to us, but rather what happens through us, through our ability to creatively choose and act toward what we want to have be. And um, um, uh, excuse me. Uh, um, yeah, so, um, so trend, in other words, is not destiny. But this all hinges upon the quality of the choices that we have the capacity to make. And uh, the, um, excuse me, I'm gonna revert to my notes here. Um, so, so creativity, uh, the ability to respond rather than react to the challenging conditions we now face, 
um, is really the act of the whole person. Uh, as Maslow said, you know, creativity is not something added like paint. It's an attribute of the whole person, the all now at onceness. And it is the very opposite of dissociation. But we've been going through a period now for some time, a geological era called the Anthropocene, in which humans are the dominant driving force of planetary change. And that force is now equipped with accelerating technological power. Uh, so for much of this time, we've been dissociated from the consequences of, of this great power as it acts upon the earth. And so our invitation now is to heal the dissociation, to become fully present. And that's what, what the, the uh, noble future of the fully human, becoming fully human is about. It's about becoming fully present, becoming whole. And, and the key to that, of course, is our children, because they are the ones who will ultimately be choosing. And how do we nurture their wholeness? How do we nurture their deep connection? This is the transformation that is now occurring in education. It's uh, based on the advancing science of human development, how to optimize all of our capacities, mental, physical, uh, emotional, relational, and of course, spiritual. So where we want to get to uh, through this optimization of human development is the regaining of our deep connection to the totality of the living universe and uh, to each other in that living universe and thus to be able to co-creatively move forward to create the best possible future. So from that deep connection to, to where we are presently, you know, I want to go back to Joan and how we move from a time of protect to connect. Well, the words protect and connect really come from the study of the nervous system and neurobiology. <clears throat> and what happens when kids grow up in poverty, uh, when there's neglect, when there's inequality, when there's violence in the home or trauma? That makes a brain that's looking for negativity and wants to protect itself. And the, that's, that's what happens when, when we live in fear. So the foundation, I think, of our kids making healthy choices that can bring forth a new world is to nurture connecting rather than protecting. And there's such good evidence for all of this Roughly 51% of the children in the United States have some degree of trauma, what's called adverse childhood experiences. And yet, if you go into a school, uh, preschool, early grades, all grades, and teach a little bit of social and emotional intelligence and mindfulness, and by the way, there are curriculums available mm -hmm. So the teachers can learn this as they're teaching their students. What happens is the brains of kids who've had trauma at home and less advantages begin to catch up with the brains of kids who are advantaged. It takes very little to do that. So all of us have got mm. to have some activity in the front of our brains our prefrontal cortex that allows us to envision, to set goals, to make choices, and to get where we're going. And we need to nurture those brains and hearts of our kids so that they can connect, make peace, make great choices, and not be stuck in themselves. So this is why I just kind of came in as an also on Gordon's beautiful chapter, but it's so important. Well, um, and I would just like to add mm -hmm. something that was important to that chapter, and that is the, the dissociation we've experienced throughout the Anthropocene. Um, we are also, uh, according to Yuval Harari and many people, 
uh, in danger of really losing our sovereignty, our capacity to choose the future through the acceleration of artificial intelligence, uh, which Yuval uh, Harari, the uh, Israeli historian, you know, calls the new tyranny. Uh, you know, as choices are being increasingly made by algorithms based on mass data, and, and, and our collective actions uh, uh, continue to be something that doesn't represent what in our hearts we know is really important uh, to, to harmonize in this universe. So uh, Harari says, for every dollar and every minute we spend, spend on developing artificial intelligence, we need to spend a dollar and a minute developing human consciousness and especially our wisdom and compassion. And that's why this transformation worldwide of education that is now taking place, social and emotional learning, uh, uh, collaboration, project-based learning, uh, but going back to early childhood and how we develop attention and reflection. At any rate, we know how to optimize human development and, and how, to, how does the result to come forward as fully present and interconnected on this planet. And I think that's what needs to be our most important commitment going forward. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for showing us the way to a noble future, especially through our young people. So we're going to invite you all to do something a little bit different now. So we just heard about how you can educate uh, for the future. But right now, in the present moment, we're going to invite Drs. JJ and Desiree Hertog to um, lead us in a bit of a visualization based on their chapter, which is called Awakening to the Limitless Mind. Are we ready? Dr. J.J. Hertak and Dr. Desiree Hertak. Yes, we are joyous to be with all of you here. And as this wonderful picture shows us on the top of the book, we are part of an infinite arrangement as we see our beautiful blue-green planet Mother Earth in the center of this mandala with each of us reaching together. Let us visualize also a great heart of humanity being open through our synergy through our symphonic, symphonic consciousness being raised on high, connecting with all cultures and all humanity and being that divine spark. And so let us realize that consciousness is the highest essence of who we truly are. And let us look at the thoughts that our brain filters within us every moment is our moment of choice to choose the thoughts of the love, to choose the thoughts of light, to hold hands as you see in the cover of the book with one another, with greater love, with greater understanding and with greater wisdom. Hold the planet also within our arms and visualize the higher light energy transforming all people's hearts and minds to a greater power of peace, a greater power of love. And we have come together as a fellowship of light, the avant-garde of the future, to connect the power of the infinite mind with the global mind and ultimately with the cosmic mind. We visualize in meditation, prayer and reflection that the greater harmony, the greater love, the greater awareness must now come into this age of divine spirit. And as we share with the people throughout the world, those who are suffering in conflict in South Sudan, those who are suffering in hospitals throughout the world with the COVID, let us understand also the privilege of having the corona of the crown of glory, the Kether Kaimot, <laughs> as it is also called by the prophets. Let us be this beacon of light. Let us be this connecting mandala of all hearts, minds, and spirits as we realize the greatest scientific breakthrough since the splitting of the atom has been the non-locality of consciousness. And so let us take a minute to feel that love. You have to raise your hands to receive it and receive our moment of choice to receive the love, to receive the light, to receive divine energy from the cosmos, from the universal mind, 
and from the infinite power that wishes all of us to come together as a global humanity. Let our moments of choice be the dance of the heart, be the song of the soul, be the unity of humanity throughout this world as we prepare to be cosmic citizens with those from the cosmic cultures of the infinite way, the infinite mind, and the infinite spirit all brought together through this magnificent statement. Our moment of choice is also a moment of being cosmic citizens in the book of eternity. We thank you. And so we are blessed. And we are blessed to have you two with us and your beautiful chapter in the book, Our Moment of Choice. Thank you so much, JJ and Desiree Hertuck. Now that we've, uh, we've journeyed into our limitless mind, some of you may be wondering, well, what really are the practical steps that we can take to move into this new paradigm together and to make it real here on, on planet Earth? So we're going to hear from some of our contributors to circle three, which is about conscious enterprise and social change. We have uh, three contributors, Steve Farrell, who is the Worldwide Executive Director of Humanities Team, and David Gershon of the Empowerment Institute. Some of you may be taking his Jedi training. And Gino Pastore Ng, who's been training and empowering young people in the Oakland area. And they've all contributed to this circle, which is really about how to, how to put our hands and feet to work to make all of this come into manifestation. So let's hear from Steve Farrell about the dawn of a conscious business movement. So let me, let me uh, just begin by saying that um, as has been stated, this, this is so much more important than a book name. This is really not just about a book name. The book is incredibly important because the authors bring out the fullness of what consciousness is. We bring consciousness out of the closet in this book. But this is, this is such an important movement right now that we pivot from unconscious living where we have no regard for the connection in all of life to consciousness, which is where we have this con connection and communion with, with the ecology of life. So this chapter of mine called the, the, the Dawn of a Conscious Business Movement is about bringing business into that. Business is the most powerful institution on the planet today. It's the most powerful institution on the planet. And so business has to come into the fullness of consciousness, this, this uh, connection, which we can even right in this moment feel into, where in this very moment, we can feel into this connection with each other with nature, with the planet, and where we don't just close the door on that, which is what happens in most businesses around the world today. But we close the door on that connection. And instead, the conversation is, and, and I'm a business person by background, the conversation is about sales targets. It's about revenue growth and profit growth. And so businesses are living inside silos where there's not that deep sense of connection and communion with the planet. And, uh, and business is pulling the train. That's what, I, when I say it's the most important institution on the planet, it, in a sense, it's pulling the whole train of global society. So it has to become conscious. If we're gonna create this pivot and we're gonna move beyond this existential crisis into a sustainable planet, into flourishing on the planet. And it's, it's, it's so simple. The process is so simple because all, it, all we're doing in conscious business is we're leaving that door open to that, that felt sense of connection. And we're bringing that felt sense of connection into our collaboration decision-making so that we're creating products and services that nurture families and that nurture communities and that nurture the world. And in a conscious business, then of course, there's no room for things like GMOs, where we're actually hurting individuals, hurting families, hurting communities, hurting nature. Um, now, there's one other 
dimension to this as well, which is the bigger dimension if we're not business people ourselves. And that's us as conscious consumers, where we have the power of, of our pocketbook and where we put the power of our pocketbook behind conscious brands that are supporting the well-being of communities and of the world. And when we do this, it's not only for the collective well-being that we're, because we're now putting our pocketbook behind conscious companies that are growing on the earth. Of course, conscious brands mean healthy brands. So we're not ending up in these places of obesity and other things where we're eating or drinking uh, uh, unconscious kinds of products. So these are the two things that we, as, as consumers, we put the power of our pocketbook behind conscious brands and as business people, we leave the door open to our connection, our communion with each other, with Gaia, and if we wanna bring in spiritual terms with the divine. Thank you so much, Steve Farrell. And thank you for the conscious business declaration that I really urge anyone who's in business to look it up and sign, it, sign on to it. This is the future, conscious business. So next we have David Gershon. He has a modest goal. It's called reinventing the planet, a bottom-up strategy. <laughs> David Gershon. Thank you, Deborah. And everybody, greetings my friends around the world and all my beautiful EL friends of years. It's an honor to be amongst a group of such wise and illumined beings. So the question of our moment in time is, unless we rapidly change our trajectory as a species, our civilization will unravel. So the question is, how do we change? So, the problem, I believe, is not the world's unwillingness to change, but the approaches that we use to bring about change. If we wish to change the world, reinvent the planet, if you will, we need to first change the way we think about change. So my chapter provides a new way of thinking about social change based on my four decades of being in the trenches of social change. And it's called second order change or transformative social change. And it's applied as part of a grand strategy we call reinventing the planet. And the goal of this strategy is to build second order change capacity to further humanity's five evolutionary goals. Personal empowerment and full human potential is the first goal. The second is peace on earth and the oneness of humanity. The third is climate stability and a healed earth. The fourth is knowledge that we need to evolve our social systems. How do we change? And the fifth is the financial abundance needed to scale this type of change. But this is more than a strategy. It's an actual action plan that's achieving measurable and scalable second order change around each of these evolutionary goals. Here's a brief overview on second order change, if you will. Our civilization is organized into social systems, such as economic systems, political systems, healthcare systems. Because of a multitude of reasons, many of which have been explained already, these systems are now deeply stressed. When a social system becomes deeply stressed, it starts to oscillate and become unstable. If this continues, it becomes unmoored from that which keeps it in place and breaks down. The US national political system is a poster child of this breakdown. But here's the good news. When a social system becomes unmoored enough to break down, it can also break through to a higher level of performance and social value. How to do this is called second order change. And I invite you to learn more about second order change. I wish I could go into more detail and our grand strategy to implement it in our moment of choice. Let me just close by saying, I wish us God's speed. Take a deep breath in and feel that God's speed inside of your own breath in seizing this unprecedented evolutionary moment and creating our beautiful world anew. That is our charge. And that is what I believe our moment of choice offers you and us all. So bless you and thank you. 
Thank you, David Gershon, for that powerful breath of hope for the future. And now, our third uh, contributor to this chapter, Gino Pastori Ng, he's written about youth-led social enterprise projects, but I think he has a unique way that he's going to express himself to us today. So I give you Gino Pastori Ng. Yes, thank you, Deborah. Thank you, everyone. It's an honor to be included in this project. And I'll just briefly say that my chapter in the book is about my work in Oakland, California, my hometown, and highlighting the success of some of the young social entrepreneurs that I work with. Those are young people who are creating the conscious businesses that recognize the oneness of all life. So I really encourage you to read the book and learn more about them. Uh, but today I want to share a song that I think reflects what this whole book is all about, which is really a matter of identity and who are we and who are we going to choose to be. And this song came about at another gathering where we were asked this question of who is we, meaning who do we want to become in this moment? And someone revealed that who in Arabic means divine essence. That's H-U. So who is we is the question and who is we is the answer that we are all divine essence. And I think that's what this book is trying to communicate and what everyone who's on this call is trying to achieve is how to manifest that way of being. So without further ado, this is a song and the person who shared that revelation is named Tazin Ayub and you're gonna hear her voice sing on this song. So enjoy. I'm trying to act in my enlightened self-interest and listen to your story, bear witness. I look in the mirror, why am I stressing? But who I am is divine essence. I notice the solstice is my Christmas. I sit under trees and I find presence. Wisdom that speaks to all of my questions. The river is deep, I don't mind swimming. Don't fear death, there is no final resting. Every place I grace, I tend to find blessings. Don't believe in time, but it's my obsession. I'm trying to get paid so I can buy attention. The United States is in the ninth inning. Are you trying to escape or do you like prison? New types of hate subdue my vision. But I do have faith that we'll choose connection. beautifully in every moment I have the choice of who to be usually I choose to be a human being in finer moments the whole community I expand my scope across the huge sea I am the watcher my friend priest of Bruce Lee I don't need so many people who are truly free I let go of my ego for sake of unity the difference of who I am and who is we the illusion of separation at two degrees but do I need a nation that I don't choose to leave I pray for our shadow down on wounded knee. A spiritual battle, take me to the trees. I'm here to unravel, may I move with ease. Bring all pieces together so do to flee. So I can remember the root of who is we. Who is me? 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 Thank you, Gino Pastori Ng, for sharing both your deep work empowering youth and also your marvelous musical talent. It's all a joy. Thank you so much. As you can see, we have quite a variety of people who have contributed to this book. And the next two are both deeply connected to their indigenous roots. We have asked Connie Buffalo, who wrote a very beautiful chapter for this book called One Good Person. We've asked her to read a short passage from her work in our moment of choice. Connie Buffalo. 
Bonjour. It's good to see you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yes, thank you. So, so when I hear everybody speaking so beautifully about, about our one humanity and all of that, I, I keep, I, you know, I keep looking at the cover of this book. And when I see the cover of this book, um, there's, there's all of us holding hands on the outside. And in our tradition, we would think that we are the earth is in, in the teaching that I do. I ask people if there is, if they want to see one of the most beautiful sights of the earth and one of the miracles of the earth and one of the most amazing beings of the earth, it only takes going and looking in the mirror because in so many ways we've forgotten that we're children of the earth. We are the earth. We're, we're, we're made of its fabric and its essence. And when we talk about our humanity, I think what I want to do is just ask you to consider that, that in the greatness of our humanity, we're no more than a thread in this weaving of life and in all creation. I think Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce said it best, I hope you don't mind if I read, 166 years ago. And he said, all things are connected. What befalls the earth befalls the, saint, the sons of the earth. This we know. The earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites us all. Man does not weave this web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does also to himself. It's interesting that in our English language, the majority of our words are, are nouns. And we have a tendency, if we looked at a worldview of, of our Western worldview, it tends to be very object-oriented. And so what I invite you to do is to take a step deep into the relationships around you, and that's into the living world. When I was lost in the Colorado mountains, when I lived in Denver, and I would go for a hike in the mountains, I always had to make it back to my tent before the thunders came in. You do not want to be standing up in the Colorado mountains when the thunders come because they bring the lightning to make love with the mother. You don't want to get in their way. So I'm, I'm usually very good with directions, and in this time, I was totally lost. So I took my tobacco, and I put it down at one of the grandfather trees, and I introduced myself and said, Grandfather, I'm so sorry to, I, I, I'm sorry to say this, but I've lost my way back to the tent. Not unlike how lost we are sometimes in moving back into this whole sphere of creation who are our relationships. And no sooner had I spoken my prayer and made my offering, and my offering, my asema, is taking the spirit that I am and the spirit of my asema, my tobacco, and moving it into the spirit of the tree. It's my bridge. It's my offering. No sooner had I said that than this great raven, I mean, a great raven, great raven, <laughs> flew across my shoulders and flew into the tree about 20 feet in front of me. Oh, more same. I got my same out and, and the Migwitch, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And this raven flew from tree to tree to tree to tree to take me all the way back to my tent where a beautiful red fox was awaiting me. Now, this communion with the world around us is something that I think we've forgotten. It's not just for me, it's for all of us. And the, the standing people, all of our relations are, are so ready to be there standing with us. No matter what we in our silly two-legged way do, they'll endure. They'll go on, maybe in a different form, but they'll go on. So we have to be very clear, I think, that it's not the world we're trying to save. It's we two-legged who are trying to save. They are our elders. They've been, the world has, the animals, the mountains, the streams, the rivers, and the oceans have been there before us. 
and they will be there after us. And it's for us to join our hearts, perhaps with them, and step back into the family of creation. And in humility, ask for help and ask for direction and see how they get along with each other and how they deal when there's an intrusion, how the trees and the great intelligence system of their roots communicate with one another to face adversity. Because from our relations, we learn so much and we learn where we truly belong and who we are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Connie Buffalo. That was so beautiful. And thank you for reminding us of the wisdom that we have forgotten. Much appreciated. We have another uh, indigenous perspective in this book, which comes from hereditary chief Phil Lane Jr., who has devoted much of his life to bringing forth powerful indigenous prophecies. And he's going to tell us a little bit about the prophecies today and how they relate to this book, Our Moment of Choice. Brother Phil. Midaki Epi, my very, very beloved members of our human family, past, present, and future. More than 500 years ago across the Americas, there existed the most enlightened, the most unified, the most spiritually advanced civilization ever known in the annals of human history. The union of the condor, the quetzal, and the eagle. Within this union were estimates between 90 to 108 million human beings when our relatives arrived as destined as the world is around. And when these forces arrived, we had this incredible epic lesson we're learning between the powers of physical science, the powers of Western science that had not yet understood oneness. And so here in these lands, the powers of the spirit and the powers of the physical Western science came together in great struggle. And we held on. We've never surrendered understanding of oneness. We've never surrendered our connection to Mother Earth. And we knew, we kept praying that no material force and the power in this universe could overtake the power of our beloved creator. And so it's been this very day, our moment of choice has been prophesied for over 500 years when finally the powers of science and the powers of spirituality would come together and unite and demonstrate before Mother Earth that the fundamental strength of this universe is spirit. And at spirit, the foundation, there is nothing anywhere, any place that will prevent the fulfillment completely of this union. And this union was established on June 20th, 2020. From this oneness, it's easy to see some of the key issues that will be dealt with this next 30 years. The equality of women and men, fundamental, fundamental for the move forward. The elimination of all prejudice, for we understand we're one, there's nobody above or less. Each of us has a sovereignty, ancient, imperishable, and everlasting. The balancing of the streams of wealth and poverty that's increasing everywhere in Mother Earth. This will change, and it's changing dramatically, rapidly, dynamically at this time of rapid change. Of course, understanding oneness comes the understanding of universal education for every child on this Mother Earth. As my Uncle Vine Deloria Jr. said, we will judge a civilization in the future by how they treat those at the dawn of their lives and the twilight of their lives. Universal education. Unity and diversity. Unity and diversity. That's why we wear bright colors, because we see our creator of all good things. While creating oneness, created infinite deserve diversity. There is not one grain in the world. You can go and find one grain the same as the other, just like ourselves. Each of us is sovereignty, ancient, perishable, everlasting. And, and I shared the unity 
to spirituality and science. So my daki epi, my beloved relatives, we are moving forward to the beginning of world peace by 2030. This, our moment of choice, is the foundation of this movement forward. It is a foundation where merged together are the powers of the spirit and the powers of science. To think 43 relatives from around Mother Earth, from various diverse perspectives, have come together in unity and oneness and harmony, is in fact a re re reflection of what's going to be coming before us. So, as these days are called, the day that shall not be followed by night. And looking deep into the Lord's Prayer, we've been saying it all along, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And also, the last shall be first. And so, Mitaki Epi, we begin remembering our relatives of a great Arab relatives right there in the Dead Sea in Jordan. We went to see our relatives, the holy place of our relatives in Israel, Palestine. And then on the 6th of February, we prayed at Armageddon to begin this process that we are now in. And then from there, we continue to pray the spring equinox, eight hours. On the 20th, we came together across the America for more than 24 hours. We consulted, and last night, we sealed it with one heart and one mind. At sunrise, across the Americas, in every valley, in every jungle, in every high plains, the indigenous peoples are rising everywhere all at once to revitalize, to restore the union of the condor and the quetzal and the eagle, even much greater than it's ever been, far greater, because now we're beginning to see in science and spirituality the reality. We are one human family, and not only that, we're understanding even more deeply the prior unity and oneness of a human family. As said, we just come from one clot of blood. So Midakiapi, when you see this white buffalo, it's come from the prophecies of the Ahantuan Dakota white swan people, the pink toes, pink nose, pure albino, it'll begin appearing different places. You'll know we are at work. To conclude this beautiful book that was put together, I want to thank the editors. I've never seen such capacity to unite the hearts and minds of the people in one foundation. So I'm going to close with a little prayer here for unity from the ancient of days. Oh my God, oh my God, unite the hearts of thy servants and reveal unto them thy great purpose. They follow thy commandments and abide in thy law. Help them, O God, in their endeavor and grant them strength to serve thee. O God, <clears throat> illumine their hearts and their minds in oneness. Haole mi chante washtelo, shunkmano he meado, chinupasapa he meado. My names are shunkmano. My name is chinupasapa. And I stand responsible before the Creator for all my words and actions. And as my father said, he said, son, if you can't be happy today, what day are you waiting for? Aho! Aho! Thank you, Chief Phil Lane Jr., for those powerful words and the vision of Peace on Earth 2030. We're with you. We stand with you. So we're going, we're going, coming into the home stretch now. We're going to take a very short video break to hear from Sarah McCrum from Down Under. She's the author of Love Money, Money Loves You. And then we will begin to wrap up our program for today. This is our moment of choice. 
Have you noticed that every time you make a good choice, it makes a difference? So imagine the power of making lots of good choices and lots of us making lots of good choices. Then we wouldn't have to wait for the big guys and the systems to change in order to transform our world. The combination of all of our choices would be way more powerful than waiting for them. So this is why I'd like to recommend the book, Our Moment of Choice. It brings together some of the world's best writers and thinkers who are sharing with you what they believe are the most important choices that we as individuals can make and showing you how to make those choices in your own life. Our choices matter more now than ever before. So what are you going to choose in the coming days and weeks? Please go to ourmomentofchoice.com where you can buy the book, Our Moment of Choice. Thank you, Sarah McCrum. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty with our schedule because uh, as you know, we're running a bit behind because we have so many wonderful people to hear from and we want to hear from every one of them. And you don't want to miss the closing music, which is also going to be spectacular. So I'm going to invite Greg Braden to speak next. Greg, as you heard from Diana at the beginning and from Bob Atkinson, he was one of the inspirations for this book. He had given us, gifted us the title, Our Moment of Choice, many years ago, probably at least 10 years ago. And uh, when the book project came around again, we asked him, could we still use this title? He generously said, yes, of course you can. And we still liked the title, but we had no idea. Right now, truly everyone on the planet can see that this is the moment. This is our moment of choice. So we're deeply grateful Greg wrote the introduction to the book and also a chapter of his own. And we're delighted to have him with us today to help launch this book. Greg Braden. Uh, Deborah, thank you so much. And it, it's so good to be with you and uh, to see everyone, all of, uh, all, all of my dear friends, brothers, sisters, colleagues that I've had the opportunity to see in the, in the last uh, few moments. Uh, I'm coming to you from a studio uh, outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico today in northern New Mexico. We're filming video segments uh, for a, another conference. So I missed the, the first part of, of this launch and I apologize for that. But I, uh, I just want to say what an honor it is to be with all of my esteemed colleagues, brothers and sisters. Deborah, this is, uh, it is like the birth of our, our child that, that we envisioned. Um, I, I've lost track of how many years ago we began talking about this book, and it's not the first time that we attempted to, to launch uh, a project like this. And, uh, you know, I've also learned to trust in the process. And I think we tried this in the past. It just wasn't the time. We had no way of knowing when our moment of choice was being put together that the world would be where it is right now, precisely the specific. We certainly knew in general that we're living a time of extremes. And that is no secret to our indigenous ancestors, as you've heard. And it's no secret to the scientists of the world who focus on pure science. Uh, our extremes are being driven by a rare convergence of cycles. Cycles that we have never witnessed converging in this way in 5,000 years of recorded human history. Cycles of climate, cycles of economy, and cycles of human conflict. And when you put these three cycles together, converging in the way that they are right now. They open a rare window of opportunity because it's in the presence of these cycles that the unsustainable ways of thinking and living begin to break down. You don't need me to tell you that. We're witnessing it throughout the world today. What the, the value, I believe the value of our moment of choice, and, and Deborah, I'm so grateful that the book is appearing now, the perfect time right now, because as our familiar world breaks down, people respond through what they know and understand. And if they do not know that there is another way of thinking, another way of living, and that new possibilities exist, there's a tendency to revert 
to the familiar. There is a tendency to cling out of fear of the unknown, to cling to the ideas and the images and the memories of the world that we have known in the past, because that is all that is known. So the value, the value of our, our moment of choice and what we're doing right now is we are laying the foundation and providing a template of new possibilities. But, but here's the thing, and this is where it's so interesting. How do you think about a new world without placing yourself in the world now and all the limitations that we perceive now? How do we elevate ourselves out of the existing limitations when we are envisioning the world that's possible? And this, this is the challenge that we all face right now because we are conditioned to hinge our sense of well-being upon the world as it exists right now, the world around us. When the world is good, when the stock markets are good and the climate's good and people are getting along, you know, we're feeling pretty good. And when those things begin to break down and fail, it causes a lot of suffering. It causes a lot of stress. So our invitation in this book is to elevate ourselves out of where we find ourselves now in consciousness and immerse ourselves in what is possible. And as we do that, we open the door to inviting those possibilities in, into our lives. And I just I want to pick up, uh, it was so good to see Joan and, and Gordon. Uh, they're our neighbors. Joan and Gordon, if you're still watching, I love you both. You're my neighbors, and, and I don't see you as often as I would like here in northern New Mexico. But Gordon was talking about one of the fundamental shifts that we're seeing right now. COVID-19 is up for everybody. And what it is doing is it is taking out of theory and out of philosophy our relationship to our own bodies and the sovereignty of our own bodies in the presence of this world. We're being taught that we need something outside of ourselves to feel safe, to love, and to immerse ourselves in the love and the care for one another in this world. That is a choice. And this is our moment of choice. The question, do we love ourselves enough to give our bodies what they need to do what they do so very well? Because the intelligence of the human body has known and addressed contagion since we appeared on this earth 200,000 years ago. The key is we must be at our best to do precisely that. So this is one example of physical sovereignty and where where we must make the choice. How much external technology do we want to invite into our bodies and how much of our own internal technology do we remember and love and respect and choose to develop as we move forward into the new world? So when I wrote the introduction to the book, I was honored to be invited to write this introduction. I wanted to lay out the fact that this is no ordinary time in human history, that we are living this rare convergence. It's a window of opportunity. It, it doesn't last forever. So we don't want to kick the can down the road to the next generation. This is our moment to define the values that we cherish in our lives and in our world and claim those values front and center as the foundation for whatever world we choose to emerge. Values like freedom of imagination and life and community, because those are the very values that are on the line right now as people are struggling to embrace what the new world is saying to us. <clears throat> These are the values that are being tested. So we don't know what the world's going to look like. We cannot know. There are things that we cannot know right now. My sense is that if we claim these values that we cherish and we allow them to become the foundation of every choice, every policy, every law, every decision that we make, we can't go wrong, but we have to know what it is that's available. Our moment of choice is the template for just that. So I know we're limited on time, Deborah. I'll, I'll stop right there and just uh, say thank you so much for the opportunity to, to be with you all in the launch today. And I wanna thank everyone for all of your love and support as we've gone forward with this, this project. There is no other book like this that exists today. And I did a little math as I was writing this introduction. We have over 500 years of collective wisdom in this book.
that we're bringing to bear uh, our experience, our dedication, our insights, our intuition, and, uh, and that's what makes this book so powerful and so very special and so very precious in our lives. So thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for all the support all along the process of getting this book out. And we just love and appreciate you so much. Thank you. Honored to have you with us today. So everybody who has stuck with us in this program, I want you to know that we've saved some of the best for last. So I'm gonna ask you to hang in another few minutes because there's inspiration coming your way and some great music. And next we're going to hear from um, our beloved Reverend Sylvia Sumter. Thank you so much, Deborah. And to all of my beautiful uh, friends and spirits and souls, I hope you are as inspired and moved and motivated as I am. Just hearing my colleagues speak to the hope that is present before us. I'm truly, truly excited about it. You know, there's a statement that says it's always darkest before the dawn. That's not really true, but it's a wonderful statement and a metaphor. Because what I think is happening well, it may look like it's darkness, but there is so much light being born on the planet right now. And that we are moving into a great new dawning, a great new day for humanity. This is our moment in choice, where we are of choice, where we are consciously now entering into choosing the next step in our evolution. And I am so excited about that because without hope, what do we have? And this is a wake up call. There are people all across the planet who've heard the clarion call to arise and to wake up and to step into this moment. And I believe that our ability to move into this next evolutionary level of being hinges upon our ability to recognize that there's a new paradigm, that we are being called to see ourselves in a new way. We are more than mere human beings. We are spiritual beings. And as such, we are equipped with the divinity to do what is ours to do. Greg just spoke about these wonderful principles, love, peace, harmony, imagination, faith, creativity. These are all spiritual qualities and spiritual principles. And when we begin to shift moving out of just the head, but into the heart, moving beyond the mind into the spirit, because we are a threefold being. We are spirit, mind, body beings, or spirit, soul, and mind beings. And we've given a lot of emphasis uh, on the mind and the body's prowess, but it is the spirit that will heal us and move us forward. And as we begin then to, to take on and to embody our own divine nature, our divinity, and come from that place, humanity will evolve. We will heal. We will no longer see a sense of separation. We will see our oneness because in the spirit, there is no race, no creed, no ethnicity. In the spirit, there's the quality of love and harmony and collaboration, oneness, peace, abundance, health, wholeness. All of these things are essence is the essence of spirit, our own nature. So this is our choice to awaken to who we truly are. And I think that there's a, an awakening around the planet that is calling, making these wonderful holy alliances from all different walks of life and people who are now recognizing that we are one people on this planet. So we have a great opportunity to move from the head to the heart because the spirit indwells in the heart and soul of everyone. And I have faith that we will all make the right choice. We will all choose the more excellent way, the higher way, the higher path. Why? Because the spirit that indwells us is compelling us to step into who we truly are. And so this is our moment of choice. We're gonna stand up for humanity. We will stand up for one another. And Stand Up for Humanity is a movement that was inspired by Unity of Washington, D.C., because we believe that the collective holds the power, that each of us is here by divine appointment, which means each of us has a divine gift to bring to the world, to share, or we would not be here. We would not be here.
So as we share our gift, we share our light, our talent, whatever it is we have been called to bring to the world, the world heals. And so there's a question I want to ask you. Not only how will you stand up for humanity, but I want to, you to think about who have you come here to be? You're here by divine appointment. There's no mistake. You have a purpose and a reason for being here at this time. So the question is, who have you come here to be? The question is, what gift are you bringing and will you share with humanity? What good can you and will you do and offer to humanity right here and right now? Some of us are moving into the realm of science, some into the realm of spirituality, some into the realm of business. It matters not the category. What matters most is the soul of you and what you've come here to share, to be, and to do. So ponder these questions in your heart and remember who you are. You're not merely a human being. You are a spiritual being living in a spiritual universe governed by spiritual laws. And that, when we awaken to that truth, is when we will evolve and we will heal Mother Earth, all of her creations, and we will honor and value and respect and love one another. The choice is yours. I say, let's evolve. Let's move from our humanity into our divinity. So I thank you all. I thank you, Deborah, and all of you who have spoken. I'm just so inspired. I'm grateful to be a part of this book, but I'm grateful to be working with you on this planet at this time. This is the moment of choice, and I am choosing all of you. Thank you, and namaste and blessings. Thank you, Reverend Sylvia, and you are an inspiration to all of us. Thank you so much. So I'd like to uh, call upon our next four uh, contributors to the book. So we're going to hear from Dr. Nina Meyerhoff, uh, and her circle is Integrating Science and Spirituality, and she's going to speak a little bit about uh, authentic education. And then we're going to hear from three contributors from Circle Six, which has the most intriguing title, so you're not gonna wanna miss this. It's called New Frontiers Beyond Space and Time. And we're gonna hear from Dr. Evan Alexander and Karen Newell and Eve Constantine. So right now, let's hear a few words from Dr. Nina Meyerhoff about education to awaken, elevate, and evolve consciousness. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a sign that we are all together and we are one. Even though everything seems so fragmented now, it's a way of weaving ourselves through this process into the wholeness of understanding that we're all facing the same calamities at the same time. And that unites us and brings us forward. And I think it very relevant that the young people are starting to move, to activate, to bring alive what's happening inside of themselves. And it is our duty to support them in this process all around the world. The issues might look different, but the deep essence is the same. Consciousness is emerging as the guiding force. And that's so important now, because if we do this and come together, there will be a sense that we are surviving and that we come together in love and understanding. So education needs to start to begin to reflect on who is it we are working with? How do we bring new education into form? The system is decaying. It no longer serves the youth. We can alter education by bringing the individual into focus and allowing the young people to express what's hidden inside their souls. It is time to rise up 
to unite and to become one. And these young people feel it. And it is our duty to create spaces that allow this to happen and foster the change because we are the guardians of the next generation. We are the bridge builders. It is not about us. It is about them. And we must help them as they go forward. We must give them the faith that we believe in them so that they can touch inside and really carry forth their dreams. Their dreams will unite and create the solutions we need so badly for us to succeed as a human race. So I thank you and I am so grateful. And I think our moment of choice, if you look at it, this is a collective group and it isn't about any one individual. It is about coming together, weaving the tapestry, as Connie was mentioning. It is time now to understand that it is synergy that builds the future. Thank you, and I am very grateful to be part of this. Yay. Holy, holy, holy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nina Meyerhoff, for your passion for educating young people and all that you've done over the years with Children of the Earth and now the One Humanity Institute. We so appreciate you. Now, I know all of you are familiar with the work of Dr. Eben Alexander. He's the author of Proof of Heaven, and he's also written with uh, Karen Newell, Living in a Mindful Universe. And they've written a chapter in this wonderful circle about new frontiers beyond space and time that speaks to liberating human potential. So Eben Alexander and Karen Newell. Deborah, thank you so much for having us on. We're honored to be part of this uh, wonderful group of uh, uh, thinkers and, and thought leaders to help uh, take us into the next level of, of human evolution. Now, for me, 12 years ago, uh, I had a, a profound near-death experience of, with uh, bacterial meningoencephalitis that changed my world. It changed my understanding of the nature of brain and mind, nature of consciousness, the very nature of reality. Uh, but from that journey, I came back to realizing that the hardships in life, the challenges and difficulties like the COVID pandemic, the resultant economic collapse, uh, a lot of the racial strife uh, that's been exposed, uh, all of this is an opportunity for growth. These are um, hardships, uh, but just like in the world of addiction and alcoholism, you find that there is something called a gift of desperation, uh, where the tough times can actually energize the growth and the transformation and the evolution. And that's exactly what I believe we're facing now. Uh, our chapter in uh, this beautiful book, Our Moment of Choice, addresses much of what we uh, cover in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, it's a union, a synthesis of science and spirituality. And I think we've heard this theme mentioned over and over again. In many ways, the deep truths that we're arriving at through modern science, quantum physics, science of consciousness, understanding brain and mind, uh, is a profound truth of unification. In many ways, it reveals uh, the deep truths of many spiritual traditions going back thousands of years. Uh, but the thing that will make it this different this time is the objective uh, lens of science, of, of kind of a shared objective verifiable reality uh, that shows uh, this spirituality is something that is an, a natural form of the universe. And we are spiritual beings in the spiritual universe and have tremendous power to come into wholeness, to heal ourselves and this world. And that is something uh, uh, that our chapter addresses, especially in the form of the scientific support for objective idealism. That is that, uh, that there is a, a realm of the mental, of the ideal, that in many ways is the template on which uh, our, our uh, reality emerges. Now, from my point of view, uh, my world shifted dramatically uh, when I met Karen Newell, my life partner and co-author of this chapter of ours in this book, because not only was she an idealist and had lived that her whole life, but she represented heart consciousness and the binding force of love. 
So yes, this idea of metaphysical idealism or ontological idealism is actually the opposite of what really is running our secular world. And that is reductive materialism, the idea that only the physical world exists. So idealism is the exact opposite of that, that consciousness is what is fundamental and all of the unfolding reality comes out of consciousness. So why does this matter? Well, that consciousness is us. That's our hopes, our dreams, our beliefs. Our beliefs are actually changeable. Many of us cling to them as if they're actual truth, but most of our beliefs are actually just assumptions about how the world works. So this idea that we're all connected that so many of you have talked about, we often say we're connected through this binding force of love. And this love, these beliefs, all of this comes from our inner world. That's what makes up consciousness. And this really means that each of us is responsible for our unfolding reality. And so I often say, you know, that each of us needs to take that responsibility literally to heart by bringing love and gratitude and those kinds of feelings into our beings. Now, this is not to eliminate all of the hardships and uh, negative feelings we have, but to include that love and gratitude in there. And as each and every one of us can begin to live this life where our hearts are filled with this kind of gratitude, it actually radiates around to the world around us and affects it in positive ways. So I ask you to imagine a world where every child on the planet knows how to find that love from within, knowing that it's affecting people around them in positive ways. Imagine a world where every parent knows how to do the same thing. Imagine a world where every doctor, every nurse, every healthcare worker has this capacity to feel that love in their hearts, to feel that gratitude for all that is. Imagine a world where every CEO knows to do the same thing before they open an important board meeting for important decisions. Feel that love within and bring that love to action. Imagine a world where every politician can do the same thing. This is the world that we can all have. This is our moment of choice to imagine this type of world that will bring all of us into this knowing that we're all connected. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you both, Karen Newell and Evan Alexander. We are imagining that world with you and we are choosing it. Thank you. And, and what if there were a way to, to, to measure our frequency when we are in that uh, gratitude and love? Let's hear from Eve Constantine, who is a thought leader and a renowned coach. And she has written about vibrational intelligence, tapping into the language of the universe, Eve Constantine. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, everybody. Hello to all my beautiful friends and all the other people who are watching from everywhere. Um, it's just been a pleasure to be here and listen to everyone. Greg, I think your math is a bit off because the 500 collective years, I alone represent one tenth of that of conscious <laughs> being. <laughs> so I think we might double that and come out more accurately. Um, so I hope that what I'm going to add right now for my chapter can be kind of a container for how we language this, this moment in time when humanity is at a, an evolutionary inflection point of epic proportions. Um, how We know the, the off-quoted quote of Einstein's now that we can't solve the problems that we've created by the level of consciousness that created them. So how, and from where do we think about these problems? What I suggest is that we look at our levels of intelligence that we've been operating from up until now and see what's beyond that. We of course have operated from intelligence, our IQ measured by IQ, our intelligence quotient. And over the last maybe two plus decades, our emotional intelligence, intelligence, our EQ, our emotional intelligence quotient, has come into play as another uh, good measure of how we can successfully navigate on the earth, our interactions with one another. But now we know that we are part of 
and as many people have said so eloquently already, something vastly, vastly greater. We are not only a part of it, we are it. We're not really in relationship to it. We are re representatives of it. As Rumi so beautifully said, and I often quote, we are not a drop in the ocean. We are the ocean in a drop. So within each of us is everything. So I call this level of intelligence that we need to jump to our vibrational intelligence, our vibrational intelligence quotient or our VQ. And with our VQ, by practicing, by developing our VQ, we can really have a pathway and a tool on our tool. Uh, our place, our role, and our ability to act and be proactive in the whole universe. So how do we do that? Very quickly, just to give some suggestions for takeaways for people. The first thing in developing our VQ is to be willing to suspend our, what we believe to be true about how things are. Just if you will put them on the side for a moment, and I know I'm speaking on the call to probably everyone who can easily do this, but for those who are maybe new to this or going to talk to other people, um, just request that people suspend for a moment what they believe to be true. And from there, then we just need to allow to come forth a, a kind of an awakening that we can entertain, right? And what I want to say about this stage of the process is it's not hard. One of the things we need to suspend is our belief that growth is, is a struggle. That's really old school. That's yesterday's paradigm. Growth can be easy. Growth can be lovely. And indeed, it is if we allow it. So the allowing is huge. And then just to finally realize that with this ease that we're allowing in, and allowing ourselves the, how to get there, the there is really here. <laughs> so there's kind of nowhere to go. It's just, just turning on the desire, just saying, okay, I'm going to do that. I am going to start looking from a much, much grander perspective and start understanding that I am the same force of creation. This little drop, with the ocean in it, is the same force of creation of love. It is that force that created the entire universe. And so by my and each individual here, by my or our, our collective declaration of what shall be, we can move mountains, we can change the world, we can heal the oceans, we can, and we have been demonstrating that and people have referenced that on the call already. But it's really a matter of understanding that this is who we are. This is our birthright. We are nothing less than giants of the earth inhabiting this wonderful, amazing universe. So I will just quickly close by saying that maybe the quote, the admonition of the Oracle of Delphi, which when she has said, know thyself, perhaps the meaning of that is beyond knowing our psychological makeup or our physical selves. I believe that that admonition was to call us to understand this that I've just been talking about, the magnificence of who and what we are. The unlimited potential of our to create by declaration, by design, what we want to see in our personal lives and in the lives of the whole. So there's lots more to say, but I just want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you for being on the call for so long. Thank you to my fellow speakers. Honored to be in and amongst all of you and amongst all of you around the world who are listening because we're all the same. We're all giants of the earth. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Eve Constantine, for that invitation to step into our magnificence beyond, beyond what we know yet beautiful journey. So, come, in, come into the home stretch. 
We have one more video, little short video break from the very inspiring Reverend Christian Sorensen of the Seaside Center for Spiritual Living. So let's hear that now, and then we are going to hear from Dr. Kurt Johnson and Pato Banton and Antoinette Booth's daughter and their music. So let's hear from Christian Sorensen. Hello, Christian here, coming to you from Seaside right after a live streaming to our virtual audience. And what I want you to know is there are a lot of people on this planet wondering, what can I do now with all this interconnected crisis exploding at the same time? Well, I've got an answer for you. And it's right within these pages. It's called Our Moment of Choice. This anthology has been put together by some of the greatest evolutionary leaders of our time. People like Deepak Chopra, or Joan Brzezinko, or Greg Braden, or Gene Houston, or Elizabeth Satura, or Reverend Michael Beckwith. These individuals have come together, over 40 of us, and we put together our ideas into seven what we call circles. There's a half a dozen evolutionary leaders writing to each thought of the circle that deals with governance, that deals with the economics, that deals with the education that deals with the planetary, that deals with new frontiers beyond time and space. It's your moment of choice. It is our moment of choice. Do you know your choice? The choice that you're going to be making. Well, I want you to be aware that at the end of each chapter, there is a call to action. There are things that you can do. So I encourage you to go to the website, ourmomentofchoice.com, and order this book now. It will help you to make that choice. Because not making a choice is a choice. Don't you want to create what's in your heart and your soul and your genius wants to do at this time? For we have been called for times such as this. It is our moment of choice. Doesn't that raise your VQ just listening to Reverend Christian? <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, there is one more co-editor of the book who has been so important in this process, and especially in bringing the work forward into the future through this, these next couple of months, through Peace Weekend and the Caravan of Unity and, and uh, through his publications and his media outlets. I want to introduce you to our final speaker before we get to the closing music, Dr. Kurt Johnson. No, thank you so much. So to wrap things up quickly, we've come all the way to the end of the book and we'll loop back to the beginning just to talk a minute about bridge building. And Dr. David Sloan Wilson and I, in that uh, chapter that we wrote, we wanted to remind everyone, because it's one of the best news of the last decade, that in 2015, mainstream science had changed its mind about natural selection. And that was announced in a book from Yale Templeton on the foundational questions of science, redefining natural selection, and David Sloan Wilson was the author. It took us from the old view of survival of the fittest, which was that meant that that was all about this, and it took us to the new view of survival of the fittest, which is as we move up levels of complexity, and particularly once there's conscious choice, the definition of fitness changes from the best competitor to the best cooperator. So once you're at the level of a sentient being like Homo sapiens and cultural evolution, it's all about cooperation. And that's now called the two-level view of natural selection. If you were getting a PhD today in evolution, that would be what you learn, not social Darwinism and survival of the fittest as let's see who can beat up on who. So social biology was rewritten by Harvard around that. You know, we had a chance to visit the Dalai Lama in November and, and talk about the implications of this because it brings together the ideals and values of the scientific community and what evolutionary process is taking us toward and the values of the millennia that we've had in the wisdom traditions and in the transformative community. So definitely really wonderful news and hopefully a part of the bridge building that all of you have talked about in today's uh, sessions. Now I've been asked to make one announcement, so I'm now not on my time, I'm on group time. And I've been asked to just honor for John Raymer. If it wasn't for John Raymer and Sign and his hooking up all of these Facebook pages, over 200 of them, we would not be reaching all the people that we're reaching today. So we want to let you know that John has another program coming up that's a part of the Caravan of Unity. 
that'll be running into Peace Weekend and the International Day of Peace that's called the Up Convergence. And it's going to be actually an entire week of programming online in combination with Unify and go through the whole list and everyone else. To find out about it, you can take, you can look at Up Convergence, you can look at S-I-N-E on Facebook, you can Google Peace Weekend, the information will be there. And so this conversation is going to have hours and hours and hours of conversation from September 11th to September 21. So I was asked to make that announcement, which I'm happy to do. And now back to Deborah and our beloveds, Pato and Antoinette. Thank you, Dr. Kurt Johnson. Thank you for all you've done to network us all in this moment of choice. So the book launches today. This is the first day that this book is on sale. It's the first book of the Evolutionary Leaders of the Source of Synergy Foundation. We're so excited that you've all been with us today to launch this book. And we are on the caravan of unity. And the caravan of unity is moving on. So let's hear some music from Pato Bantan and Antoinette Rutzdada. It's my great privilege to introduce to you Antoinette Root's daughter and Pato Banton. Come on, guys, come on. <laughs> Tell me why there's so much fighting when we could all be uniting. Tell me why there's so much greed when planet Earth can provide everybody's needs. Tell me why there's so much division. When we got so much in common To see a change you gotta be the change Shine your light, stand up for the right And let's unite As we all come together as a spiritual family Let's unite As we all come together on this caravan of unity Let's unite as we all come together as a spiritual family, let's unite. As we all come together on this caravan of unity. Well, they say each one teach one, but first we've got to reach one. So we're reaching out to the world for more unification. UNITY spells a unity. That's what we need in our global community. No more hate, prejudice, or animosity. Let's replace that with generosity. One for all and all for one. Each one teach one how to get along. Divided we fall, but together we strong. And if we stand up together, we could never go wrong. Let's unite as we all come together as a spiritual family. Let's unite. As we all come together on this caravan of unity, let's unite. As we all come together as a spiritual family, let's unite. As we all come together on this caravan of unity, hey, it's a caravan, caravan, caravan of unity. We are on a mission. Yes, we are on a mission. Caravan, caravan. Caravan of unity, we are on a mission. Yes, we are on a mission. Caravan, caravan, caravan of unity, we are on a mission. Yes, we are on a mission. Caravan, caravan, caravan of unity, we are on a mission. Yes, we are on a mission. Caravan, caravan, caravan of unity, we are on a mission. Yes, we are on a mission. Caravan, caravan, caravan of unity, we are on a mission. Yes, we are on a m
mission. Yes, we on a mission. Unnecessary I is instill international integrity to turn the tides of tyranny. Why? Cause that's the way it should be. Our people living in a harmony. Let me see a peace sign if you agree and let your voices be heard as you sing with me. Let's unite as we all come together as a spiritual family. Let's unite as we all come together on this caravan of unity. Let's unite as we all come together as a spiritual family. Let's unite as we all come together on this caravan of unity. Hey, it's a caravan, caravan, caravan of unity. Mission, yes, we are on a mission. Caravan, caravan, caravan of unity. We are on a mission, yes, we are on a mission. Caravan, caravan, caravan of unity. We are on a mission, yes, we are on a mission. Caravan, caravan, caravan of unity. We are on a mission, yes, we are on a mission. And now live and in person, Pato and Antoinette. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Greetings, everyone. Uh, very beautiful. Very beautiful. Thank you, everyone, for, in, uh, enter for being here in the presence with us in our moment of choice. So the next stop for the Caravan of Unity will be in Las Vegas. And we will be at the Nair Thomas Synagogue. So. And that will be when? Thursday. At Thursday at four. It will be yes. broadcast at four o'clock on Thursday, mm. and it will be a multi-faith gathering at the Nerd Tamid. Um, so, um, firstly, I want to say thank you to everyone that has delivered such great messages and shared so much wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and love. I want to say thank you to Kristin Hoffman for beautiful. your beautiful music as always. And I also want to apologize to Kurt Johnson, who, um, is Kurt still here? Hi Kurt, I want to apologize to you before I talk. We're running late, so I'm gonna run a little bit later. <laughs> but I want to say, Kurt, I apologize because I criticized you in March. I didn't tell you, <laughs> but secretly in the privacy of my bedroom, I criticized you for being a negative Nancy. <laughs> and you said, when everyone was saying that the COVID-19 virus was gonna last for a few months, you said it could well last to the end of the year and it could affect our physical caravan. And I thought to myself, why is he being so negative? But you are, I now classify you as Prophet Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> Realist <person. laughs> you was you looked at the situation and you was very real about it. You're gonna say something to me, Kurt. Your, your your mic isn't open yet. Well, you know, some of it's just the science. We didn't know, but what we know about is love, like Eve said. We know about love, and that's what we're all sharing, and in so many different ways and in so many talents. And what you two bring, oh my gosh, you bring that eternal optimism you know so it's always a balance right hand and left hand that's how you get anything done so thank god for your optimism and also then thank god for the grounding that makes us all realistic so that we're steering uh the course that way so love to everybody and especially to you guys 
Thank you, Kurt. And it's amazing that, um, thank you to Ben Bowler for even with the COVID-19 crisis to still imagine and to realize a way that we could actually still tour across America virtually and realistically with the camera crew who are currently at our house right now um, to make this thing still happen and to still bring us together in unity. Mm -hmm. So going to my talk, um, by the way, um, Deborah, the book arrived today, um, an hour ago, and the, postco the postcards arrived too. Um, we'll be talking about those in a minute. So we have the book with us now, which we will be reading and enjoying, I'm sure. But I wanted to just talk about our moment of choice and how we harmonize our moments of choice for the future. And I first want to start by saying that we, we have some new phenomena, phenomena that now that we never had a few years ago. Um, one of those new phenomena is multi-faith and interfaith, collaborations, multi-faith and interfaith ministers. This was unheard of a few years ago. We also have a new phenomena now called religionists without a religion. We also have ministers without a prescribed faith. Respecting everybody's belief systems while also having their moment of choice to step out of the box of their prescribed religious belief and become all embracing of everybody's belief and to be a servant and a, a server of all people where we meet at the mountaintop of spirituality. Um, I just want to also state for everybody, just a reminder that choice is a God-given gift. Free will. You know, free will, the ability to choice, choose is a God-given gift. And in the Urantia book, which I read, it says that the greatest gift that we can give back to God is our choice, our willingness to choose God's will. And just like Chief Phil Lane said earlier, thy will be done, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We all have a small fragment of God within us. And it's this fragment of God along with the Shekinah Spirit or the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of Truth. These spirits bring us together, brings like-minded people together, brings progressive people together. And when we come together, we have the ability in that moment to choose the highest choice in this universe, which is God's will. And if we want to make this truly make this world a better place, not just for the short term, but for the long term, for the greatest good of the greatest number of people, then we should choose God's will because God is the greatest scientist. God is the greatest ecologist. God is the greatest educator. God, is, God can make all of what we question, God can provide the answers. But we have to be in alignment with God and then choose that will intelligently. And by choosing that will, we create what is known as a synchronicity of spiritual unity, which means it doesn't, it doesn't matter what so-called religion we belong to. It doesn't matter what our beliefs or what ideology we have. Once we become transparent, open vessels for God's spirit to shine through us, and for the spirit of truth to work through us, then we automatically are in alignment with spirit. Whether you want to call it the great spirit, the universal spirit, the mother spirit, God, Jesus, Buddha, whatever you want to call it, once we come into alignment with the spirit, it's all one. And so that is my encouragement today, that we all remember that our ideologies are secondary that the greatest choice 
in our moment of choice is to choose the will of God in our own unique form of expression. So that's all I wanted to say today. That is our common ground. All right, so we're going to ask everybody, what is your choice and what do you choose for a better future? You know, what, what is in your minds and what you see as far as a better future and what do you choose today? What is your choice? So, and we want to ask everybody to take this moment um, to say, to, to think about this. What is, your, what is your choice during this moment? And to say in your mind, in this moment, I choose this. Okay? So take five seconds to do that. All right. Now, lastly, does anyone have a copy of this book? If you have a copy, can you please hold it up and show it to me? Come in, my brother. Who do we have here, Antoinette? Peter Melton. We've got Peter Melton with us. The caravan is here. Can you, give us, can, you give us that, can you give us that peace sign, Peter? Yes, we are truly all one. Yes. That's our choice in this moment. So, Antoinette, you hold up your car. You hold up the book, girl. You, you should hold the big book. And if you've got your book, please hold up your book. And after, I'm going to count three, two, one. And when I say three, two, one, I want everybody to, oh, everyone open your microphone, actually. <laughs> Please, everybody, turn on your microphones. And I'm going to count three, two, one. And after I say through three, two, one, I want everybody to say, this is our moment of choice. Let's unite. All right. Some of you haven't got your microphones on yet. All right. Are we ready? Let me hear you. Are we ready? Yeah. yeah. All right, and, and I'm going to say three, two, one, and I want everyone to say, this is our moment of choice, let's unite, okay? Before I do the countdown, I just want to express my heart to you and say, I love you guys so much. Congratulations, Deborah, on this mission. Congratulations, everyone, in everything you're doing. And Ben Bowler. You are so amazing. I love you, brother, so much. Thank you. All right, are we ready? Ready. Three, two, one. This, this is, our, is our moment, moment of, of choice. choice. Let's, let's, let's unite. unite. <laughs> All right, let's do it one more time. One more time. Here we go. Three, two, one. This, this is our moment, our moment, moment of choice. choice. Let's <laughs> unite. unite. Thank you, Pato and Antoinette. Thank you, Ben, for the Caravan of Unity. Thank you, Diane Williams and the Source of Synergy Foundation for producing this amazing book, Our Moment of Choice. And thank you to all of the evolutionary leaders in the Evolutionary Leaders Circle, all of the evolutionary leaders who contributed to this book so generously of their wisdom, and to all of you evolutionary leaders out there. Thank you. Let's unite. This is, in fact, our moment of choice. Thank you. It's not